Um, Okay, I'll start again. Hi, I'm Tom Perkins. Um, I live in Boulder, Colorado, so just on the, in the front range. Uh, I'm a physicist at the National Institute of Standards and Technology, as well as a professor at the University of Colorado's Molecular, Cellular, and Developmental Biology uh, Department. And as it gets to the point of what the conference this week is all about, which is called Single Molecule Biophysics, this is where we bring together the tools of physics either the, the instrumentation of theory or computation to try to understand how molecules in our bodies work. I'll uh, give you a simple example uh, that, that uh, many of us know that heart disease is hereditary. Uh, your heart like, is a muscle, it pumps, and at the smallest molecular motion, something must move. So there must be something wrong in the muscle or motor that drives heart contraction and the people um, in this field develop tools to try to understand how muscle works at the smallest level. So something that is and moves just five nanometers is incredibly hard uh, to measure. But if we can begin to learn how muscle works at the basic level, then we can begin to understand why it doesn't work with hereditary disease. So to give you an example, we know what spark plugs do, but if we don't know. Uh, if we don't know why carbon on a spark plug doesn't make an engine work, we don't know how to fix it. And what we're working here to do is develop tools that allow us to understand molecular motors and many other types of things to try to help understand fundamental biology as well as cure various human diseases. So that gives you an overview of what the 86 of us are looking at this week and uh, in this winter conference series. This is the second winter conference series. Uh, and today, uh, I have the privilege of introducing Josh Shavitz. Josh was an undergraduate at Columbia University. He then did graduate work uh, at Stanford. He went on to do a postdoctoral work uh, at the University of, of California, Berkeley, and then went to Princeton, uh, where he started his independent research group and has risen from assistant to associate and is now uh, a full professor. And along the way, he's won a number of awards, including uh, uh, the Presidential Early Career Award. Uh, and with that, I'd like to introduce Josh. Okay, so, uh, you know, I teach for a living, well, kind of, I don't really teach. We do teach. And, uh, you know, for Zoom era, we taught to blank screens. And let me tell you, lack of feedback by watching blank squares of your students pretending to learn things in the past. <laughs> I would really appreciate it if, if you guys would ask me questions about things as we go along. Um, the the physics-y folks in the audience, maybe you can save your question. Um, there'll be a question at, at the end, question and answer. So I think if you have deep philosophical questions, save that to the end. If you have something that you don't understand about what I'm saying, please ask me in real time. If you At the end of the talk, you say, in your second slide, I didn't understand what you did. That's it's hard to fix that. So um, let's not do that. Oh, I've got extra messages in my. How do I get rid of this? Ah. Sorry. Zoom. It's still on the Zoom. Uh, Jeremy, can you confirm it, it's still on the Zoom? There's a green box. I just want to make sure. Sorry. Things, recording things. It is still on Zoom. Okay, thank you very much. All right. So, um, this is the Aspen Center for Physics. You guys all think you know what physics is, and then you read this title. It didn't put you off enough. Uh, and you, you want to know what in the world I'm talking about. Uh, and so, so, hopefully, by the end, um, I'll have shown you enough pretty movies that you will have enjoyed yourself, whether or not you agree with me <laughs> that there's some cool physics to be done by studying animals. So this is the LHC, which is part of the beam line of the LHC. This is, I think, the world's largest machine. It's essentially the size of a city. Uh, and it's built by physicists to study the smallest of the small that there is in the universe, subatomic of interactions between the things that make up protons and stuff like that. Yeah. There are things inside protons and try to make them and stuff like that. So, you know, one thing that physicists do is they build machines or they build techniques that are geared 
specifically towards answering specific kinds of questions. And so a physicist looks at a question and says, what do I have to do to measure something? That's what the experimental physicists do. I'm an experimental physicist. Theoretical physicists, they, you know, they stare off in the clouds something and they invent ways at which things might work. Then importantly, they write down something that could be tested, usually with math. And so these guys have to go and try to measure something that the theorists have predicted and back and forth. And that's how we make progress in this field that we call physics. Okay. There's another nice machine. This is the James Webb Space Telescope, which launched last year. Give or take, it's, I think, about 50 meters side. So it's not the world's biggest machine, but it measures the, the universe's biggest scale. Right? This is going to probe universe at scales that we've never seen before. And so again, you have these questions that you can ask about the biggest scales. You need to build a machine that can measure these things. And one thing I want to point out is that the theoretical physicists who think about these scales are doing complex calculations, but actually in the end, they try to make them as simple as possible. And mostly the kinds of calculations they do don't go too much beyond some of the physics you may have seen in undergrad, even if you weren't a physics major. A few pieces you have. To say. But all of it is kind of just the same. So, you know, no one would argue that this is in physics. So I'm priming you for something. I want to take the same viewpoint. Building a machine to measure specific numbers that I think are informative about a system, trying to use math and equations and theory to predict things and going back and forth between this. This is to me sort of the essence of the physics enterprise. But now I want to apply it to all of this. Okay. If I gave you some stuff and I, I said, I asked you, what is, what is, you know, tell me about what this thing is made of. Could you do, you could hang it with a hammer and say, well, it took a little bit of hammer. You could carefully take it apart. This is not meant to be taken apart because nothing is, but you could take it apart and there's probably a port in there. Well, switchy buttons, surface mount switch buttons, and you could measure the distance between all of them. You could take some sort of electrode measuring device and you could measure currents and resistances and all sorts of stuff. That's fine. So you take it apart. So what do I do with, with this? Sorry, that's my son. Um, you know, the first thing is you guys all have an intuitive sense for what's going on in all of these things. If I asked you what's going on in one of them, you could tell me something. Now, this one, I think you'd be pretty accurate in interpreting. What's that? Yeah, but what's it doing? Yeah. You think it's a male showing off? Right. <laughs> this is to attract a pretty female bird, or this is to threaten another male bird? I mean, How do you know? Yeah. Okay. So, no, I think we have a sense of what you know, we'll do, kind of, but it's a little weird. We're interpreting it through our own eyes and brains and experience as humans, which is a little dangerous. But sometimes animals do things that uh, don't really expect. So, so here's two, two people. We won't be talking about humans much, but you know, I'll put this in just for fun. Uh, you know, so you're you're an alien physicist and you land on this planet and you decide to watch you know, spins and and you see this. Okay. Actually, I think even you with your brilliant human intuition that you've developed for your whole lifespan, you have a little bit of trouble sort of telling <laughs> like you could describe it, right? Like they wiggled this and they moved this and they did it together. They I don't think I've actually watched this. Okay. Well, anyway. All right. So, so how have people studied animal behavior in the past? They watch. Okay. Angerdahl goes and lives with the apes. Rents hangs out with the birds. Embergen hands out with the fish. And they sit and they watch. And they write down what they see. And they try to develop a structure in their head. How this works. This field has been called ethology. Uh, you know, I mean, reality, this has been going on since the dawn of time, right? but some caveman saw something, saw something, so that's fine. And these guys tried to make this into a science. Um, so Tim Bergen, for example, in a long time watching these fish. And these fish, you know, they mate and they fight and these do things. And so 
he took the mating part of it, for example, and he broke it up into what he intuited with his human brain and all his human experience into the things that it did. You know, sometimes they fight because the males you know, have to win over the female and so they beat each other up. And then there's some nest building things. And then there's the actual mating part and the mating part is complicated. It involves various parts of this dance and all this sort of thing. And if there's offspring, you can care for the offspring and all these things. Okay. So the ethologist by watching animals do stuff for many, many decades, developed a sense that behavior is made up of sort of discrete modules, little actions that you do with your body, and that these actions are organized in specific hierarchical ways in order for you to do larger and larger scale things. So for example, so if you probably took a shower today and you did that, you did a bunch of things that you do every time you take a shower. You washed your hair, you washed your face, you did all these things. And chances are you do them in the same pattern every day. Okay. What's really fascinating is sometimes you forget a module. Like you forgot to wash your hair. And washing your hair involves many little actions. You have to get the shampoo and you have to do the thing and you have to rinse it. So it's not like you just forgot one step. Maybe you did. You might have done your hair and you forgot to rinse it and you get out of the shower and you look. Okay, but this idea that behavior is organized in these, in these actions and through this hierarchy into larger and larger scale actions makes a lot of sense. It is how we do things. It does not seem really fair for us to look at animals and assume that they do the things that we think they do. No, right. In other words, we don't want to what's called anthropomorphize what's going on. Now, I have dogs. I think maybe you have dogs. And it is really tempting to just assign thoughts to all the cool, funny, cute things they do with you. Right? And, and actually, we know from neuroscience thoughts are all completely nonsense. But they make us feel happy. You know, it looks like the dog is smiling. Dogs don't smile. But like, you know, all these things. Okay, so what can we do as physicists? Um, this is what we're not going to do. Make a spherical cow that we assume is a uniform density and ignore the effects of gravity. Put it in a vacuum because that's not how life works. Uh, for the molecular things that are happening at this conference this week, um, these folks are making world's smallest scale measurements. And the way a normal physicist would do it would be to freeze it and put it in a vacuum. And of course, the biology doesn't even work when it's frozen in a vacuum. Biology lives in salt water at room temperature and it's actually quite horrible. Uh, and so making real physics nanoscale measurements with those things is very challenging. And that's what that's called, the molecule has been So what do we want to do? We're going to focus on body movements. There are other behaviors, vocalization, I'm not going to talk about. Everything I am talking about, you could apply these principles to vocalization, the microphone, you record stuff. We're not going to do that right now. We're going to talk about the movements of bodies. We're going to record movies of animals doing things. We're going to track what all the animal body parts are doing. Now we're going to try to understand the dynamics of the body parts. Can we write down what would be like equations of motion? Is there an F equals MA? Newton's law for behavior. We look at the statistical pattern the properties and the temporal patterns of what's going on. Okay. That, that's what we're going to try to do. We'll start with the worm. This is the nematode worm C. elegans. It is very, very cute. Uh, and it wiggles around like this. And if you take really careful pictures of them, you can make it look this good. It's just like a black thing on a white background. And so then with a the computer, you can easily segment out the worm from everything else. You could track sort of what its orientation is, what its extent is, and you can do even better than that. What you can do is you can track the center line of this. So now when we talk about the motion of body parts, for a worm, we're really talking about the wiggling of the, the center line of the worm. It has other things it can sort of do subtly. Now, stuff we're not going to track those in the worm. We're going to take these wiggly motions and ask, what can we do? How can we understand wiggling motion? When we go to uh, larger animals, this is, oh, I could just track your, your spinal cord. You tell me something. I mean, that one movie, it was quite good. good. Mostly your spinal cord aren't doing too much. What we'd like to do is track all of your body parts. You can move around uh, in multiple dimensions if we need to understand what's going on. So in the human, uh, uh, in the, the, the 
sort of topic of, of human-based pose tracking. Uh, this is quite mature at this point. I mean, it only started about 10 years ago, but uh, there's a lot of effort in doing this kind of thing. It has many, many applications, sports, security. If you think the security cameras in stores in the airport are not doing this to you, they are. They're looking at the ways you move your body and they have ways of, they can interpret some of those ways as being threatening, whether that's that nature or not. Really no, but you can do all this. So this has been mostly pushed by, by Google and a few other companies. What they do is they train on literally 100 million images. They have hand annotated 100 million images because they sell this. <laughs> okay. In the laboratory, we, you know, no one is going to measure a movie of a mouse running around and annotate 100 million images. <laughs> your students would never graduate. You would never die wanting to be annotating your things. In the Middle Ages, this is how things were done. We don't do that anymore. But we have an advantage studying animals that for the human pose people, they need to be able to track lots of different skin colors, lots of different clothing types, lots of different backgrounds. Am I inside? Am I outside? Am I in the woods? You know, different perspectives and all these sorts of things. So the data is very messy. And so they need a hundred million images. If you do laboratory experiments and you work very hard to control every variable you can possibly think of, now you can make images, why I'm talking about later, images that are much less messy, these huge images. And so we don't need a hundred thousand images, uh, labeled images to track these things. We need you can do tens and it works okay. In our real science work, we do about a thousand. You can do that through the algorithms we developed in about a day. So you take all this data, our biggest data sets are a billion images. You cannot sit there and hand click all the arms in a billion images. You also would never graduate if you tried to do that as a student. You need a computer algorithm to do that. So we, we use these things. Um, they're based on a deep neural net artificial intelligence, the newspapers, you see all these words used interchangeably. Um, they're basically modeled on the way that your brain interprets the signals from your eye. Your eye is a pixelated detector, more or less. Your retina is made up of little cells that form little pixels. Uh, and that in the very early parts of the visual system in your brain, data from the camera comes in and it is decomposed into a series of patterns. And your brain learns that if I see these kinds of patterns at these places in these scales, I call that a remote control, or whatever, or a person, or a chair, things like this. In the same way, we train these neural networks to take the pixel data from the images, to look at lots of different features on lots of different scales, and to find the this leg tip, or you know this antenna, or this wing. So it really borrows a lot from how the brain actually works. And it turns out, the converse of that is the brain is a very efficient thing. It works pretty well. We can do this with flies. Uh, we can do this with many different animals, including multiple animals. So that's a fly. Uh, these are two flies. That's a male courting a female. The female, of course, wants to play hard to get. That's how you are in evolution. And so she runs away and or kicks him in the head when he gets too close. Um, these are two bumblebees. We've done some nice work in bumblebees to show that their ability to behave properly in a social context in the hive is learned. It's like your kids had to learn. You know, you go to elementary school, you don't really learn facts. You learn how to not beat each, each other up and be nice to each other and things like that, operate. Uh, the bees have to do the same thing. Uh, this is two mice in their home cage. This is five mice running around doing things. Those are some variables. Um, so we can use these techniques to track the position of all the body parts, multiple interacting animals. So now we've taken a movie, which is basically what the ethologists, the old uh, um, way of doing this, using, I mean, they looked through their eyes, but they were just watching. And now we've converted to numerical data, right? the positions of things over time. And that's really what we're going to use. You can do this in the wild. It takes a little more training and things. So that's a giraffe at the Impala Research Center in Kenya. You work there and you can do this with many, many things. So it turns out that um, sometimes people do exactly the same thing over and over whenever they talk. So 
Uh, this gentleman has three hand gestures he uses when he gives a speech. I promise you, if you ever see him give a speech again, you will just look at this. And it's true. That is what he does. And you can track you know, how often he does them and how he moves between them. <laughs> okay. Yes. What is the confidence there? Ah, okay. Yeah, I was not going to get into any of the greetings. Let's go on this one. Go. Okay. I'm going to train, you actually train essentially a separate network to learn every body part. So the, the right front leg tip um, network learns to predict where that is. And this is sort of the probability of where it thinks it is. Where it's brightest is where it really thinks it is. And it's like, well, it might be over there, but I think it's there. So, so it's the estimate of where it is. All right, now we're gonna do some science. We're gonna to try to take body part positions over time and try to learn something. And we're gonna move up in scale uh, in animals as we go along. So this is the C. elegans worm. That was the wiggling worm that I showed you earlier. Uh, it's pretty slow. It only does a few things. It actually only has 300 neurons in its entire body. hundred of them are here in something that you can call a brain in quotes. The neuroscientists can call it a brain, but basically a brain. Um, and we have the complete wiring diagram for all the neurons in this thing. So, it, you know, it's an attractive place to start. So as we are watching that movie of a worm uh, moving, maybe you had this sense that it was cute. What does cute mean? Well, what cute really means is that the shape is very simple. It's not have a lot of kinks in it. You don't need a lot of information to describe the shape of a worm because it looks like a little wiggle. Nice. And it turns out if you take all the images you've ever seen of the worms, then you mathematically ask, what is the simplest way I can build up these shapes by adding up a few different shapes? The answer is you need four shapes. These two are basically the same. They are a sine wave, if you remember that from school, so a couple wiggles, and they're offset from each other. This one has a bend, and this one is kind of extra straight. And so any shape of the worm we measure, we can now convert into four numbers, which is how much of this shape are you, how much of this shape are you, how much of this one, and how much of this one. So instead of a movie, now we have four numbers over time. The first two, which are these offset sine waves, if you go back and forth between them, what you do is you send a traveling wave on the worm. In other words, the worm does what you would call this, and that's how it does locomotion. So on the right is the amplitude of how much the one sine wave do I have or the other one. And if I trade off these amplitudes, I get a worm that does this, and that's how it crawls around in the world. They can go forward, they can go backwards, they can go reverse wave. So if you look at during locomotion, the excitations of these two shapes, two sine waves, you can see it's always in a circle. I'm going sine wave one, then sine wave two, and sine wave three, et cetera, and I get this traveling wave. It sends the body forwards. The angle here in the circle is increasing over time. I get forward locomotion. I can run it backwards, I'll get backwards locomotion. So that's how the animal moves around, by actuating these two uh, different modes. What about that third shape? Well, that third shape is like one bend. And if I apply this to some of these, what I get are worms that like to turn. So if I walk the trajectory of a worm in space, it crawls forwards. And then it does this turn thing, so it can crawl it a different direction. In order to make that turn happen, it has to turn on the shape. In addition to these two, and that will make it like extra bendy, and then it can make a turn. And then it turns out there's actually different kinds of turns. Just pull it in. Okay. We good so far? Four numbers. All we need. Now. Might have thought that we could write down uh, the equations that govern the dynamics of these four numbers. And this turns out to be very hard. Actually, the worm is chaotic. 
you remember if you were alive in the 80s, you remember chaos was a big thing. It's sort of gone as a favor uh, since then. I mean, the math is still there. It's cool. You just don't hear about it as much news anymore. Um, in chaos, what you have are physical systems, mechanical systems, sometimes very simple ones, actually, that you think would be very well behaved and simple and easy. And in fact, they are so complicated in their dynamics that two states, I can prepare two different systems that are exactly the same, except a very, very small difference. If I let them evolve through the dynamics of chaos, after a little while, you will have no idea that they used to be a similar state. Okay, so the classic example of this in mechanics is the double pendulum. This is, this is a fixed point, it can rotate here, and this can also rotate here. And in fact, there are three pendula here. Um, they're all starting in basically the same place. They're evolving by just normal Newtonian mechanics. You see very quickly, they just completely decohere from each other. They look completely different, even though they started very, very different. Turns out the worm is basically the same. You can find instances in time where the worm shape is like completely identical and you let it evolve in time and it'll do something slightly different. So in chaos, you don't just try to blindly write down the equations if you have some data, because that just never works. What you do is you study the trajectories that the system makes over time. This is something called the Lorentz attractor. It just makes it movie. Uh, a lot of this was done in the early days of Lorenz. And so if you go to every region these trajectories go through and you study how they oh God, that's crazy, separate out and things, you can learn about the physics of the system without having to sort of guess what the equations might be. And so this is something that we can do with the worm. So here we have the angle in that circle that described the locomotion. So it's sort of how much of the one sine wave you had versus the other one. If I drive the angle forwards, that's like a forward traveling wave. Drive it backwards, that would be a backward traveling wave. This is the speed at which I go around uh, that circle. And so each line here is a measured trajectory of what it does. Okay, so these are forward locomotion. My Angle is changing in time with a positive angular velocity. These here are backwards locomotion. Here we have states where I sit at a fixed place. I don't have any angular velocity and those are pause states. These are trajectories where I am not moving very much at that in time. So now you can look at how the worm moves across all of these different trajectories. Here's one example. The worm starts here, it's moving forward, it falls down into a pause, does a little turn, it comes back out, it's still moving forward, then falls into this other pause, which is a different configuration, but still non-moving state. And then it decides to go backwards. Now it's going backwards, it pauses again, backwards, pauses again. By studying each of these trajectories independently, trying to think about how the dynamics lives both on average and also how the, the individual trajectories uh, move, you can understand not only what would be akin to the energetics of the system, but also the sources of noise that give rise to sort of individuality of each trajectory. Okay, they start out the same, but they do something sort of different. And that's because the brain is not just running one program over and over, the brain will kick it between different programs. And that's akin to having noise in this kind of mechanical system. I'm not going to write down all the equations. I thought that was maybe not the best thing to do for a public lecture, but I want to give you a sense of how we think about it. Okay. If you add a third dimension, this, what we can discover are not only forward and backward uh, um, uh, kinds of motions, but you can discover turning motions. And this is all the very much the same kind of thing. You look at the trajectories, you say, how is the best way that I can visualize these trajectories in a you know, reasonable kind of uh, a space? And then lo and behold, what comes out is that you have compartments, essentially trajectories that group together and correspond to these classical behaviors. So how have we moved on from what Jane Goodall did? We didn't sit there with the worm and say, oh, well, sometimes it's going forwards, sometimes it's going backwards. Oh, that looks like a, that looks like a different kind of curve. 
And in fact, you know, the worm biologists had obviously done this for 60, 70 years. Uh, and it's not that they got it wrong. It's just that it's, I think, much more satisfying if you can take the data. And the data tells you there are three kinds of behavior. It also tells you what they are and how to find them and how much variation there is each time they happen, things like that. Okay, and so that's the way that I think the kinds of approaches that we're doing differ from what came before, even if sometimes the outcome isn't so different. Right, so now I told you that the worm had 302 neurons and we understand all the wiring diagrams and all that. Okay, so we can take those neurons. So the balls here are the cell bodies of the neurons the lines are how they're connected. So this is like the wiring schematic of a worm. You go to Intel, they give you the schematic of the CPU. You go to the, the schematic of the worm. Okay, this is some diagram that just tells you everybody's really connected. You know, we can make each of these neurons flow uh, using fancy things. I won't tell you how all that kind of genetics and optogenetics works, but. We can make them glow, and we can make them glow in a way that's proportional to their activity. So not only can we just measure where they are, but I can tell you how much electricity essentially is going through different neurons. So this is like watching your computer chip and knowing what all the voltages are everywhere all the time. That, you know, if you're an electrical engineer, this should tell you how it works. Okay? Now, there's one problem with this. Let's say... Uh, you know, you have this worm and you make this microscope that can take this kind of a crazy 3D cool picture right there. And then, you know, you start your experiment and you're all excited and, and well, the worm falls away. <laughs> so, That's not very good. Yeah. So you have to make a microscope that can track the worm and keep it, yeah. its brain always in the same place relative to the microscope, even though it's crawling around and all these sorts of things. Yeah. This takes all sorts of interesting in instrumentation that I won't go into, but... Uh, you know, th these are hard experiments, hard in the in the real sense of like the experiments. Uh, but we've done this. So here we have a worm that's crawling all around in the real world. We are keeping in real space its brain completely fixed. So we can measure the activity of all the neurons as it's freely moving around and doing the things that it wants to do. Okay, so here's just one example of the kind of data we get. There's a hundred something neurons in the head. So these are all the brain neurons in color. So time is on this X axis. Color is the activity of the neurons. You can see there's all sorts of interesting patterns. And down here, we have the behavior the animal is doing uh, where we measure that using the sorts of things I was just talking about. And so maybe you can convince yourself that there are some patterns here correspond to specific behaviors. And so I could read the mind of the worm and tell you what the behaviors were doing. Indeed, that works. So you can take neural data and you can learn an algorithm from the neural data to predict, for example, the velocity of the worm, the curvature of the body, whether it's locomoting forwards or backwards, et cetera. So in black, uh, here we have the data, blue lines is the predictions from the brain. I didn't measure the body for that. I, I measure the brain. I predict the body and I compare it to what actually happened. And in fact, here we're going to have a movie where one of these is the real worm. The other one is we're telling you what we think it's doing based on reading the brain. Yeah. They're not exactly the same. Okay, so not only did we use the data of the body motion to find the behaviors, we can really confirm that these are real because we can read the brain and the brain tells you they happen. So this, I don't know, there was a TV show where the pilot started out this was quantum computing. Mm -hmm. and this is the thing that they had as their success, <laughs> basically. I don't think they realized that we actually do. All right, any questions about wiggling, wriggling worms? We need to move on larger. The wonderful organisms. This is the fruit fly, Lanagaster. If you leave your fruit out or your wine out, et cetera, and you get these in your kitchen, I think they're much cuter actually when you look at this. Uh, they are much more complicated than the worm, so we'll have to use that neural net based body part track we talked about. They have many more complicated behaviors. If you watch this movie, it does all sorts of interesting things. They have 100,000 neurons, and we don't have a wiring diagram. But that's okay. We can do something. So we're not going to study the trajectories of all 20-something actuatable body parts in three dimensions. 
that is just too hard for the kinds of chaotic uh, analysis techniques that we and others have, have sort of worked on. And so I'm gonna talk about a different way of trying to figure out what these animals are doing. And so rather than asking the computer to find me when the animal is moving, find me when the animal is, let's say, grooming. Grooming like that. Rather than doing that, we're gonna tell the computer what we mean by a behavior. What we're gonna say is what we mean are stereotype body dynamics. Epics in time where the body does something and then another epic time when it did the same thing. Okay. So body, you know, the animal use the body in the same way over and over at different times. So the computer then has to figure out how many of those different sorts of things are there and when do they happen? So we're not telling it what grooming is. We're telling it to find stereotype things and see what happens when it comes out. Okay, so we're going to take this sort of tracking. So here's some locomotion. Here's some grooming. The eye. I, uh, so no, their, their whole head is. In fact, their whole brain is almost all visual. So there's, there's a lot of it. And the eye gets dusty. So what do they do? They rub their legs over their eyes, but their neck is so actuatable. They basically go like this and the whole head turns. It's like the coolest thing. The animals are really neat. So we have that tracking. You can think of that tracking as what we would call a time series. So this is the position of the different six different legs as a function of time. And it's walking and they oscillate back and forth, right? Because the legs are doing this. That, so they oscillate back and forth. Ed grooming has some other kinds of dynamics. It's also sort of oscillatory. And right, certainly with this one, but also with this one, there are characteristic sort of frequencies, right? Is it happening fast? Is it happening slow? Which body parts are moving at what frequencies? We can use that kind of information to find the stereotype dynamics in the body motion. And so to do that, we have to have a way of understanding frequencies. So uh, here is the best way I've thought about to teach you what a spectrogram is. So this is a, um, on the y-axis, we have the amplitude of sound, which you can think of pressure amplitude or velocity amplitude as, the same, uh, as a function of time. Uh, if you zoom in somewhere, you can see it's very wiggly. And this is the sound pressure for 10 seconds. <laughs> Me playing a C scale on a flugelhorn last week when I was trying to figure out how to teach about spectrum. Okay. And so this is not a perfect sine wave. If it was a perfect sine wave, it would sound like a buzzer. The reason that instruments sound like instruments is because they produce non sine waves, but they're still a characteristic frequency. Okay. So we can take this uh, little bit of the pressure versus time uh, data and we can ask what frequencies are present in there. What would we see? Well, the biggest one is there's this spacing. So this shape, this shape, this shape, this shape, and that's whatever that time period is. And so that's a big one. There's other ones, right? We have these little wiggles in here. There's, there's higher frequencies in there also. And so we can take it every instance in time, we can calculate the frequencies that are present. <laughs> So this is what we call the fundamental frequency. This is C, D, E, F, G, A, B, C. They're going up in frequency. We have harmonics that you see. This is what makes it sound like a flugelhorn. If I played the trumpet, they would look different. And so we have the frequency over time. And with the, the scale, I, I could I, if you were to cluster these, you would tell me there's eight things that happened. All of these look the same. And then all of these look the same. All of these look each note in the scale would have been pulled out as similar sets of time that had the same kind of frequencies in them. And that's exactly what we're going to do with the animal body part stuff. We're going to take the position of all the legs and all the antennae and all the actually a feeding tube, I'll just leave there, things like that. all these sorts of things. We're going to, for each one of them, calculate the frequencies that it moves at as a function of time. It's something crazy, it's not a C scale. It doesn't have, I mean, it has harmonics, it has all sorts of. Thing. And then we're going to take every instance in time and say, well, you know, here the legs were moving at this frequency, this leg wasn't moving, and this one, whatever. I can compare them across time. 
And I can compare every time point to every other time point. And I can ask how similar they are. And I can ask the computer to group them together based on how similar they are. Okay. And there's lots of ways of doing this. It's something you would call clustering. It's like if I measured all of your heights, I could somehow group you into different clusters of different heights. Children, um, we're going to take all the time points from a fly. Each dot here is a time point. That dot knows all the frequencies that the body part does. And then going to compare how similar those frequencies are to all their dots. And I'm going to try to rearrange the dots that they're next to things that have similar frequency. And this makes a curiously cool movie. Uh, there you can do this. This is another tech, another sort of part of machine learning, manifold in learning or manifold embedding. It happens. And what you get with the fly is this arrangement of the dots. And so if I look at where there are more dots, or if it's red, that means there's a lot of dots. It really means there's not so many dots. I have this organization of all the different times. Every time point in a movie lives somewhere here. And each of these places is a specific kind of thing that the body does. So what are those things? We can look at this one. And this one is tripod locomotion. If you look at each of these movies, this is 64 examples of different flies at different times where the computer said they're all doing that thing. You can see these are all moving in an alternating gait. So you walk like this, you alternate two legs. That's not very exciting. But if you had four legs, and you were doing sort of normal walking, you would do the opposite pairs like this. And if you have six legs, you have to do three and one and three and the other, alternating tripod. Okay. And in fact, all of these states here are other kinds of locomotion, faster, slightly different gait, things like that. If you had a horse trotting, you know, would be a different gait. We go up here and ask, what is this motion? This is front leg grooming. My two legs, and I go like this. And in fact, this one is grooming to the right side. I look over here, this is the same thing, but grooming on the other side. If you look here, this is left wing grooming. So uh, in addition to the visual system, eyes smell things, with little hairs all over their body. So they spend a lot of time to get dust off of all the little hairs on their body, including the wings. So this thing takes its leg, wraps it around to rub it against the wing, which ends up folding, and that gets the, 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 the dust off. Okay. And then here, look very carefully, this one, at the very front of the animal, you will see this little thing come out of the mouth, of the head, and that's the feeding tube. Okay. So the algorithm, the computer, finds all of these behaviors. We didn't tell it that there was something as grooming. He just said, find all the repeated dynamics. It does this and it finds all the behaviors that you would normally classify. You can compare this to a human. You can do all sorts of things. And basically the computer always wins. You, yes, you're a physicist. You're not supposed to be educated. Go ahead. Hmm? I, that's the probability density. You're not supposed to be asking that. Okay. You can do this with any animal, it turns out. Uh, so for example, uh, here is the hip hop baby from YouTube, you put 2013. You put your one arm out, you put your one arm in, and you shake it all about. You do the hokey pokey and you turn yourself around, and that's what it's all about. All right, so you can take her and you can get exactly the same kind of uh, space, collection of time points by looking at those spectrograms and indeed, each of those things is one of the parts of the genus. This makes sense. Okay. So what have we learned with the flies? Um, we've done a lot of things. I'm just going to summarize a few of them. And this one gets back to what I originally said, Tim Bergen's work and the, the stickleback of fish is that behavior is organized hierarchically. How did he discover that? Well, he made it up. I mean, he watched things and he wrote things down and it looked like that. I guess. How do you do it? So we have a way of doing this from our data. So our computer takes the videos of the flies and it tells you what all the behaviors that happen and when they happen, it makes a list. Because at this time point, it did this. And at this time, it did this other behavior. It groomed this and it ran around and stopped running, whatever, went to sleep, sleep the state. And you're gonna take that and you're gonna ask, if I know the behavior now, 
I would like to predict the behavior sometime in the future. What is the best way for me to group the behaviors into two groups that is maximally informative about the future? To do that, it turns out the best thing to do is to take doing anything and doing nothing. Make those your two groups. That's maximally informative if you're only allowed two groups. What if you're allowed three groups, you'd like to predict what happened in the future based on now. Then doing nothing stays a group. Locomoting becomes its own group. And then you have another group, which is all the motions that don't have to do with locomotion, don't involve walking. This is all the grooming and feeding and all that stuff. You can then ask it for four groups. What if I would like the maximally informative way of breaking up the time, the, the clustering things into four different groups? You again have slow and you have locomotion, and then you have the front grooming -y stuff and the back grooming -y stuff. The back grooming stuff, if you ask for more, will be broken up into side things and back. So what does this mean in terms of this prediction in the future? This means that as you, as a fly, as a fly does something, it will continue to do things similar to that in these kinds of categories. If I'm locomoting, I will keep locomoting rather than scratching my head, you know, probabilistically. If I'm grooming the back stuff in my body, I tend to keep doing that or those sorts of back things before I go to groom the head. Like there's some really nice uh, work from a professor named Julie Simpson where you take a fly and you dust it, you throw a bunch of dust on it, which it doesn't like, then it has to groom all that off. And what it does is it does the head the medium and then the middle and the back. does it in this specific order and when it does the head it's not just the head it has to do the antenna it has to do the eyes it has to do the legs so there's a compartmentalization of all that and it is hierarchical you can show that from the data not just from sort of what i don't want to keep you too long so this looks scary and i'm just not going to stop it. But, uh, we can do no physics-y like things with this data this, is so exciting. this one will be more exciting. Okay, so the why is 100,000 neurons in the brain? Um, I am not nearly smart enough to think about 100,000 neurons. I have no idea. I don't think anyone really is. That's very complicated. But the 100,000 neurons are mainly there to interpret all the signals in the world. When's the last time I ate? How bright is it outside? Where's all the stuff that's moving? All the things like this. And then I connect all the thoughts to the body and the muscles through something like a, a few hundred neurons that send all the commands to the body to do stuff. So what we can do is we can optically take each one of those one by one and turn them on and ask what happened. And you know, you can do some experiment like this. We have many flies. We're gonna turn light on, they're gonna do things. Here's an example. Here's a, here's a fly. This is a neuron that's gonna turn out to be a hind grooming neuron. The animal's hanging out doing its thing, we're gonna turn the light on and it's gonna groom its butt and, and its rear legs. Sometimes the wings, maybe I don't know. They will keep doing this as long as the light is on kind of forever. In fact, it will keep doing it until it dies. If you get the light on. So we've done this for every one of these 300 neurons and it turns out we can activate every behavior. You, you sometimes have to do combinations of them and things. So we understand now can't read the mind, can't read the mind of, of the fly. If we could read all those neurons at once, we could probably could, but we can't. But we can at least activate them, and that tells the body how to do it. I'm going to really quickly gonna do more. All right, we're going to talk about fighting fish. This is our next organism. Um, this is two fish in a cubic tank that we use. And you can tell right away a two dimensional version of this would not be very good. It's moving all in dimensions. So you have to move to three dimensions. They're vertebrate, so they're more like you. They have a lot more neurons, 100 million neurons. You have, you, sorry, they have 10 million neurons. You have 100 million neurons. A lot of neurons. And we were thinking about fighting. Here, you have to track in 3D. So we're basically going to do kinds of body part tracking I've already talked about in 2D for three different cameras. And then you can put together that data, make a 3D image of things. Here, for example, Tracking of two fish hitting each other. And to make kind of a long story short, you can't look at a single fish and ask how its motions are affected by the other fish. Really, they enter into joint. 
like asking a ballroom dancer to dance by him or herself and then watching that and then thinking about what the partner does like that doesn't work, right? The dance is a collective phenomena of the two animals. And the same thing is true. So we had to make collective variables and look at the dynamics of collective variables. And uh, the fight is made up of many different dance moves. These are two body dance moves where winner comes and attacks, the loser attacks, or they circle around each other. Or they swim parallel to each other for a little while. One is darting towards the other one. You can find all of these behaviors from the data in the same sorts of things we talked about for one animal, now two animals. And what is sort of really interesting to me, fight starts because the winner picks the fight. It's very interesting because it means the winner is kind of predetermined. He picks a fight. And red is sort of like winner, like putting on the thing. You see this. The fight ends when the loser gives up. Not only does the loser give up, but actually the loser sort of goes, oh, this is the wrong color. Who should be a loser? Delete that. The loser starts attacking more and more and more until they realize, I'll say he, because these are males. Either. So he realizes this futile, and then it turns off all the attacks and it acts very docile. And in the wild, this means that fish would eat, wouldn't get to eat uh, as early on when the food appears. And so... Uh, less likely, five less likely to be. Okay, so, from these two body couple dynamics, we can uh, define, you know, from the with the computer what all the different maneuvers are of the dance. And using that, we can say, you know, how fights start and how they end and what determines the winner and the loser and things. Like that. That's what we're doing uh, with fish, also with the. Fish is more exciting. Okay, so that's the talk today. I hope. Uh, we have a little bit of, of understanding now of how we use tools that you might normally think of from uh, physics, both in experiment, physical physics and theory, uh, to understand the statistical properties of animal movements, uh, to define specific behavioral sequences, look at individuality, social interactions, things like that. Now you can ask me about free will. We have about 10 minutes of questions. Josh, do you want to handle your own questions? I'm good. Exactly. The question going back to the LED on the fruit line where you're, you turn on that line and it's going yeah. to do this until it dies. Yeah. Can you expand a little bit on how you're, I don't know if the word is manipulating or controlling that neuron? Um, how we're controlling it is easy. You, you put in the protein that. Oh, the question is. I think there's two questions. The easy one is how are you controlling the neurons in the fly? That one is is you have it genetically express a protein that when it absorbs that wavelength of infrared, shoots ions into the neuron and turns it off. Oh, okay. That that one was an easy one. I think you have something more. Well, I just can that be expanded? I mean, obviously the small fruit fly. Have you been able to do that in something with more neurons like the fighting fish or a mouse. Uh, you can do it in all of these, yes, both optically and it, with electrodes. So the, the more classical way of doing this is with an electrode. They're like your neurons really are electrical things. They work with ions, not, not electrons moving in a conducting metal. It's ions moving in a fluid um, and across membranes and things. But you can inject current, current away, destab, you know, change the potential, and you will change uh, the activity of neurons in all brains. Uh, and yes, you can use this for stimulation. You can use this for therapeutics. Yeah, the optical thing is nice because you can genetically tell the fly to only put that protein in this special neuron. Otherwise, you'd have to have a way of having your electrode figure out where that neuron is. And that's very hard. But the genetics know what neuron that is. Way in the back. Um, the question is, uh, besides this objectives, do we have any, any other goals for studying the animal behaviors and uh, whether the human neurons are identical to animal neurons? So we study that. Well, okay. So, uh, the second question is very easy. Are human neurons the same as other neurons? Uh, certainly. I mean, yes. Basically, 
animal, you know, a mouse, much more brains and neurons, much more like that. The worm is actually weird. The worm has funny neurons. More or less, there are differences. There are different types. But, you know, it, certainly as you get closer to humans in terms of whether you're a mammal, et cetera, that's, that's much more, uh, they're much more. Okay, so then, then the, the first question was, what the hell, why are you doing all this? Sense. And yes, you're a physicist, and maybe you convinced me that you can use math for animals, but why do I care? Okay, that's, that's a very valid, good, good question. And so I, I'll give you what I think are uh, the three, let's say four main use cases for this sort of thing. I mean, as a physicist, I'm just inherently interested in how much we can learn from these things, what's fundamental, we look across animals, like, like what is really kind of fundamental and what is really deep. Yeah. That's and that's more of a physics -y perspective. Uh, in neuroscience, there's a huge effort to build technologies like optogenetics, like electrophysiology, uh, um, all sorts of genetic tools to manipulate the brain, measure brain activity, measure the connections between all the brains. But the output of the animal is behavior. It's not enough just to measure. It's like you take a computer chip, and you don't measure, you know, it's driving some monitor. You, you don't look at the monitor, you just look at the computer chip, I think you miss. But you don't learn what a graphics card true purpose is if you're not looking at what the output is. And so we're trying to build tools that will allow the neuroscience community to really understand their brain perturbations and recordings better because now they have the output. And traditionally outputs have been very simple. I solved the maze, I left or I went right. The flies, it was classically, I walk, I like to walk up the wall. I walk up instead of down. Uh, you, know, fly, you ever thought about why a fly is called a fly? When you see a fly, is it flying? No. It's like sitting on the wall. It could be called walk. <laughs> so um, so that, that's sort of in neuroscience, we have a similar kind of story in terms of uh, genetics and genomics. You can ask how um, species have evolved and there's lots of things that go into evolution. But certainly, what you want to think about is the phenotype. What is the animal doing relative to the environment and things like this? And that involves behavior. It's not only behavior, there's other things you have to know. But behavior is a big part of it. Understand that. And then lastly, there are a lot of um, therapeutic applications for these sorts of things that we're doing. We work with a number of groups, um, you know, uh, diagnosing things like autism earlier. There are ways where you can use these kinds of principles to generate numerical data that we understand for humans and then try to use that to do sort of therapeutics and diagnostics. And so we sort of work on that. All right. Yes. Is the mapping of the neurons something that goes on together with your studies of the movements and things and say for the Fruit fly, you said they're 100,000? Yep. And how long would that take in principle? Or, I mean, is it something, is that part of what you're doing at the same time? Okay. So the question is about what in the field is called connectomics, which is the task of making wiring diagrams from brains. Uh, and uh, I do not work personally in this. This is a big endeavor. It's very hard. Um, in a worm, this is done by taking a nut hole whole bunch of worms, and I was like, tens of worms, slicing everything up, taking electron microscope pictures of them, painstakingly, like now using a computer, but originally it was not a computer, it was a person <laughs> trying to trace what's going on. Uh, one thing I didn't say about this wiring diagram is it's not the most informative thing at this point. You can't run a simulation. People have tried this. Stick it in a computer. You say, well, this is the rule for every connection that I have, and you know, go. It certainly doesn't make a worm. Um, part of this is because you need more than just which wire goes where. You need to know like how that connection works. But also, I just think there's a lot of details. Um, but there are efforts of this in all these animals. So in the fly, uh, we are getting pretty close with automated. Uh, for essence tools, and there's multiple efforts. One's at Princeton, and one at Virginia Farm. There's one effort uh, to do this. Uh, in the mouse brain, they have done little bits of it. So we have kind of full connectomes for one little chunk of the mouse brain. So the whole thing is like, hey. It's also, as I say, it's also not clear. <coughs> if you did that, 
you spent all the money. You, you get you took all the money away from the LHC, the James Webb Space Telescope, and you stuck it in Connectomics. Okay, maybe you would get somewhere, you know, in the decade, but what you would do with that, I think, is not clear. Yeah. So I'm curious about your uh, use to early diagnosis of autism. Okay. So does that mean you're looking at an individual human being and comparing their behaviors to some wider range of humans who may not have, is, is it that individual that you're looking at? Wow. The question is, uh, what are you what are you doing if you'd like to to use something like this to detect early autism or some other sort of neurological disorder? And then, yeah, the, the the point is you track lots of people who have the disorder who don't have the disorder, so you understand the variation in all the motion movement, and then you can take a patient, compare their motions and things like that. So yeah, this is interesting. this works. Um, uh, so something very similar. Um, happens when you're trying to diagnose you know, um, sort of neural or, or movement-based disorders in very young children, because you can't talk to them. It's like, you can't go to your dog and you say, what's wrong? Something, what's wrong? You can't do this with a baby either. And so there's a series of tests you do on babies, particularly uh, premature babies, where they're worried about brain development and brain function, um, where they know just from experience and practice, like you poke this or you stick, an object here or whatever, I mean, at every age, things are supposed to happen. And if they don't happen, then there may be a problem and you have to go investigate further. So okay. we're, we're thinking about doing sort of better versions of that. We track and, and it's more, you know, sort of more naturalistic. And okay, with that answer, let us uh, thank John for... Thank you for coming to the Aspen Center for...